Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks for taking the time to listen to me. I'll try to make it short and sweet. And uh, it's always great to be back at the GSP. I, I'm here today to talk about how to, in my experience with our learners, how to build a performance culture in a corporate environment. And I, it's, it's very simple, but it's at the same time very tough to do it on a daily basis. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you some examples and relate a lot to sports and life in academia here at business school, for example. One of the things, uh, the first things I'd like to throw at you is a provocation, in that uh, until the age of 22, 24 years old, all of us have been through school, high school, college, sports, in some sort of form. And we all accept a lot of things as being, you know, natural. So the fact that there is a coach in sports, that the coach relates directly, don't delegate that with the players that there is a locker room talk, lots of pressure being put on the players before the game, straight feedback, players that are playing well play, players that are not playing so well are sold or stay on the bench, where poor performance is dealt with, where amazing performance is recognized and awarded, where people are treated differently according to their talents and performance and track record, all this is, is natural, you know. Um, at school, the same thing. I mean, the best students, you know, they are in the RJ's list and uh, the 10% top. They got scholarships. They got recognized. They got named. There was a ranking in sports. And yes, there are people at the bottom. And that's the idea, that people at the bottom feel bad and they want to go to the top. So yeah, that's the idea, to create the tension. So we live with that and we think that all makes sense. And then at the end of 22, 24, we go to the corporate world. And all of a sudden, a lot of things that were so natural and made so much sense in a corporate world because of many things, corporate, pre I mean, peer pressure, politically correct way of doing things, whatever you want to label it, you start being, feeling that you cannot do what you used to do before. So a lot of people, for example, in, in big corporations say, I don't have time to recruit people. You know, I, I send somebody else. I'm too high up in the organization. And I think uh, uh, HR people, they have to deal with that, you know? I want them to bring me the best talent, then they'll work with me. But I'm not gonna do it myself, and I don't have time. I have a busy agenda. Again, can you imagine, can you imagine the coach, you know, saying to somebody else, hey, I don't have time, go talk to my players, go select players, and go, you know, do the locker room talk for me before the, this very important game because I'm doing something else, managing some paperwork? No. Can you imagine a teacher a professor coming to class and saying, well, today I'm going to send an assistant to teach because I don't have time for my students, so I'm going to do that. So, no, of course you cannot imagine. But when you go to a company, you think it's natural to hire a headhunter, to hire or, or, or just to, to ask somebody at the HR to do this for you. When you go to a big company, you see low performance, and you, you want to act on it, but somehow people pressure you. You know, this guy has been here for 20 years. It's low performance for sure, but I mean, you know, uh, maybe, maybe next year. I mean, let's give it one more opportunity. And again, it's different from the kind of lives you had before the corporate life. So that's the first provocation I want to throw out there. Why is that that when we enter the corporate world, a lot of things that worked so well in sports at school and were so natural, when it comes to corporate world, it's so, kind of, it's so hard to implement. And that's one of the things, in my vision, in my opinion, that uh, gets a lot of companies not to be a good or high-performing company because they're full of these barriers, okay, to act naturally. Second thing I wanted to, 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 to table here before we start is the whole idea that companies are formed by people. <laughs> Common sense, of course. Of course, but a lot of people, again, when you're in sports and you are in a tough game and you are half time, the players get together and they say, we have to solve this. There's no like, the team will take care of it. You know, we have to solve it. We have to change strategy, we have to change players, we have to do something differently because if we do the same, we'll get the same results. If you're at school and you're performing badly in a, in a subject and you have a final next week, you have to deal with it. You're gonna ask somebody, I mean, you can ask for help, but at the end of the day, it's you who's gonna go there and write the exam. So it's you, you have to fix it. It's not the company. When you go to the corporate world, all of a sudden there is this image of or this idea, perception, that there's something of a, a higher hierarchy called the company. And so you, are, you have a problem and you say, yeah, 
I'm sure the company will come with something and they, they'll tell us what to do and uh, yeah, let's wait. I mean, maybe they will think of something and uh, you know, there's this uh, thing like a company with some spirit in a black room, you know, that you slip, you slip messages underneath the door with a question and they will answer back to you. You never see them because they are the company. And uh, no, I mean, the company is us. I mean, myself and 100,000 other colleagues of mine, they are the company. If we're excited, knowing what we want to do, aligned, inspired, moving forward, learning, attracting better people than we are all the time, the company is moving in that direction. It's progressing. It's growing. If we're all going in different directions, waiting for somebody else to solve our problems, not acting on things we should act, like low performance or poor performance, and, you know, feeling that, oh, you know, we're big, everything's going to be fine, we'll never fail, that's the first step into failing. And that doesn't get you to be a great, a great company. So with these two ideas, now let's go into what we learned, three things that create a top-performing culture. We're not saying this is the only way to do it. I'm saying we've done it for 21 years, and it has worked. It's not perfect, will never be, but that, that has worked. Okay? So the first three things are dream, people, culture. I'll explain. Because the company is us, people. Dream, the idea of the dream is something that comes naturally. We always had dream in our lives, you know. We've always dreamt of something, and that's what keeps us going. That Monday morning, when you're tired, when it's snowy out there, not here, uh, when it's cold, <laughs> when it's cold or too warm, maybe too warm here, and you feel like, oh man, I have to bike to class. But you have that dream. You have that dream of, you know, doing well at school, dating that person, you know, being hired by that company, buying that car. So dream is something that for human beings click, I think, much more than visions and missions. Missions are for military, visions are for, I don't know for whom. But, <laughs> but dream is something that we all understand because through our life, dream is something that has always propped up, you know, propped us up to the next step. So in our company, we don't have vision, we don't have a mission, we have a dream. We want to be the best in what we do in a better world. That's it, okay? And why is the dream important? First, because again, it's about human beings. Second, because dream big or dream small takes the same amount of energy. Think about that. One or the other takes the same amount of energy. So why not dream big? You know, If you don't do it for yourself, nobody will knock at your door and say, hey, your dream's too small. Why don't you aim here? Nobody will do that. And in our experience, we've always reached our dreams never the way we planned. That's real life because you learn, because competition does something, the environment changes. But if you have a dream that's stretched enough that you know 80% how to get there, and the other 20, you learn along the way, you believe you can learn along the way, that's something that can inspire people, get the bar higher, and getting the bar higher, you tell the message, good is not good enough, guys. If you want to be the best in what we do and go from here to here, that's the gap. We did the very best to get us there. So the dream is only good if people buy into it, if they commit to it, if they bring their passion to it. That's why I don't like the word fun. I think fun is too weak. I don't like people in our company to have fun. I have fun at the beach with my kids. I like people in the company to have fun, sure, plus passion, plus commitment, plus energy, plus lots of other things. You know, fun is too weak. You know, if you want to be the best in what we do. But there are differences. Again, the dream is to be something that inspires and credible enough so people buy into it because you have to work hard. It's not a target, it's a dream. And by definition, it's a tough one. It's a stretched one. It's not an adventure. If you put out there an adventure and say, guys, we're going to double the value of the company next year, and people say, oh my God, okay, you're, you're going to commit to that. I'm going to do something else. That's an adventure. An adventure is when you know 20% how to get there, and you believe, wrongly, in our experience, that 80% you can discover along the way. Dream's the opposite. You know 80% how to get there, but that 20% stretch, as per our experience, is what you, can, you learn. And the learning curve, copying from others, tripping over things that you didn't know were there, or just, you know, learning from the environment. That's a dream. And the dream has to be powerful enough to commit people. And again, dream big or small takes the same amount of energy. Um, the other thing about the dream that's very important is that uh, dream big brings the best of people. Think about this. Think about the high jump. I mean, dream is about this. I mean, you put the threshold here. You put the bar here. Who, which human being 
having the bar here, even if the guy could, would jump here. Because we're rational. We optimize energy. We optimize time. So if the bar is here, we're going to jump enough to clear the hurdle, even if you can jump here. So the idea of the dream is that, is the high jump, is to keep putting the bar higher so you can see what you, the company, the team, the group, can do. And as a leader, you have, it's an art and science. You have to keep putting that bar higher and higher until you find that limit with what you have today, and then you learn some more, and then next year you can do a bit higher, but with what, what's the maximum performance you can deliver. So that's the first thing, and that's very important, because if you don't buy into the dream, a lot of things I'm going to say from now on don't make any sense. If you're just trying to survive as a company, nine to six, you know, just have a job because I have other interests and that's it, forget it. That's not the company for you, that kind of company. Okay? So that's why the dream is very important. Second thing, you can only have dream if you have people, because people are the ones dreaming. Okay? A couple things. Great companies are formed by great people. Obvious. But so many people forget about it. People think that great companies are formed by great products, great cash flow, great uh, installations, assets, asset base. No. Even in a consumer goods company, what distinguishes you from an average company is the kind of people you can attract, retain, deploy, develop, train, promote within your company. That's it. Because behind the ba a brand that's doing well in the market, you have people that understood consumers, had the insights, execute according to the insights, and put translated all that behind a brand. That's why the brand's successful. Not because of the brand. The brand was there, was the second step. First step was to have great people. Okay? So again, great companies can only be formed by great people. Second thing, great people attract more great people. That's important because the opposite is very sad. Mediocre people attract more mediocre people. They like to work together, you know. <laughs> it's amazing. Mediocre people love to work together because nobody challenges anybody. The targets that they give to each other are kind of, you know, easy. You know, 120% how to get there January 1st, so it's a piece of cake. Everything is fine. The feedbacks in your yearly performance evaluation is always like, you're a great guy. No gaps. I mean, you're terrific. You're going to be the next president of this company one day. You know, you're so great. Mediocre people, they love that. Great people is the opposite. They love to challenge each other. They don't take it personal because they know it's for the, best, for, for the best of the business. They know it's not about themselves, it's about the business. So you can ch they know there's no hidden agenda. So you can challenge them in meetings because it's all about what's best for the business. And they like to work with each other because by challenging one another, they keep raising the bar. And that brings the best in you, that forces you to continue to be updated and learn because everybody else is pressuring you. That's why it's so good to hire people that are better than you, because they force you to be better. If you hire a whole bunch of mediocre people that, that think that you're the greatest guy on earth, you're going to start going like this, because you have no incentive, no push to get better. OK? That's the other thing. What's great? You say, I'm saying great people attract more of great people. What's great? If, if, if there is a lack of definition anywhere, just take you and your colleagues as a benchmark. I'm not saying we were great. But if, we, if this is what we know, myself and my colleagues, I want to hire people that with the right training and the right development can be better in some years than we are today. That's great. And smart people are not afraid of that. Mediocre people are very afraid of that. They don't want very bright people in their teams because, hey, that's going to overshadow me. That's going to put me out of job, you know. Smart people, even for the wrong reasons, they arrive at the same place. That's much better to have a team of high achievers because that will help you as a leader to get to your targets in a more consistent way and it will help you to get promoted faster <coughs> because you have a pipeline of people. So even if you're selfish, so even if you're thinking about the wrong things, only think about you, not about the business, you get to the same place. <coughs> but it's better to have in your team great people, very talented people because that will be good for you and if you think in a more noble way, that's the best thing for the company. Okay? So we look at leaders, and one of the traits that we look a lot is the capacity that they have to form, find, recruit, retain, develop people. Because leaders that can only use people that were developed by others, they're good leaders. 
but they're not the ones that will, will, will get you 20 years from now, 30 years from now with the kind of pipeline that you need. Okay? Okay, so we're talking about great people. In our experience, what, does, what, what kind of environment keeps great people on board? Because great people are very volatile. They could be, especially here in Silicon Valley. I mean, if you have something, you know, somebody who's very good, it will be hired by somebody else two years here, one year here. Great people in our experience like three things. They like to work in a place where meritocracy is the name of the game, where informality is the way things are done, and where candor is the way to go. Okay? Meritocracy. <laughs> Easier said than done. Again, in sports, of course, it's meritocracy. The, the good players play. The others don't. In school, of course, if you have an F, you know exactly what it means. You fail. If you have an A, you got the scholarship. Of course. But then you get to the company. Performance evaluations are not that straightforward. Because you're saying, oh, today's a Friday, poor guy. I mean, poor me and poor him. I mean, or poor her. I'll wait for the Monday. And then Monday you're traveling. Ah, a, year, a year goes by, two years, ten years. And you never said, your coworker, what this person needs to, to listen. You play God. You play God. You say, no, no, I'm going to manage it this way. I'm not going to say it today. Because I think by himself, for some you know, strange reason, he's going to click to it, get better. And therefore, I can avoid this uh, you know, moment that we're going to have now. You know? Of course, it never happens. Because this click, it doesn't happen. Constructive feedback is what gets people to get better. In my life, I, I owe a lot to what I learned to constructive and respectful feedback. That's what gets you to, to progress, people that are interested in your success. But for that, you have to have tough conversations. It's not everything rosy. Okay? So again, they like meritocracy. And think about this. It's so easy. Again, peer pressure. You go to a company. You lead a, a, a business unit. You have a vacancy. Somebody got promoted. And you have to fill that vacancy. I mean, in sports, you'd go for the best player. But in the company, people start pressuring you and say, well, well what, about, what about Mike? Mike has been here for 20 years. I mean, he deserves it, you know? OK, he's not the sharpest tool in the, in the den. But I mean, it's pretty good. People like him. I'm sure it's going to be OK. And then you have Jane, who just joined two years ago, and you know, deserves that big time because built a track record, is a culture ambassador, has potential, will do a, is a much better fit. And sometimes, if you promote Mike, nobody will ask you questions but Jane. If you promote Jane, Jane won't ask you a question, but everybody else will. And guess what? If you promote Mike, Jane sees through that, and she's leave, and she and she leaves. And all of a sudden, you're left with only the mediocre people who thinks that the thing of patronizing and promoting the senior guys is the best thing to do, as opposed to meritocracy. The worst thing in a company, since you cannot please everybody. That's another lesson that I learned time and time again. If you cannot please everybody, please the most talented ones. <laughs> I'd rather have the most talented people saying, this is my company. And people that are mediocre say, oh, man, that's a drag. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to leave this company. You know, great. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to leave the company. So because sometimes the way to solve a problem is to create a problem. That's why when you have a poor performing guy, you should give two, three feedbacks, of course. Because people, again, they grow with feedback, constructive, positive feedback. But after three feedbacks, a year went past, the guy's not performing, it's better for both of you to let that guy go. First, because you create a problem, that vacancy. And in creating a problem, you have to solve the problem. If the guy remains there for another 10 years because you don't have the problem, you don't have the urge to solve the problem. So create the problem. Let the guy go, because that guy could be a, a huge success in another company, but not here. So don't waste his time. Life's too short. Don't waste his, his or her time. Tell him or her what they need to know and move on. Okay? So that sounds like harsh, but it's not. Think about sports. That's what happens, and we accept it. I'm not saying we like it, but we accept it. Another thing that great people like is informality. Informality is not the way you dress. But it's the environment you create in the company that people can speak up, speak their minds, as long as they are constructive and respectful. That's why in our office, for example, nobody has a, an office space. I don't have an office space. I, I, I'm the CEO of the company, but I, I share a big table with my, all my direct reports. And in all our offices across the globe, everybody has the same kind of layout. Why? Because that gets information flowing. 
that gets people to, to connect in two-minute meetings, five-minute meetings as they interact across the table, or they meet somebody across the corridor. Think of that. Not only Outlook would allow you to schedule five-minute meetings, right? I mean, I, I, I haven't got that. But if you are together with people and you interact with Gart here in two minutes, he's talking about Brazil and uh, we interact two minutes here, and then somebody asks about something and you're interacting here five minutes, bang, you get much stuff done. And people are exposed both ways. So no place to hide, much better for you to get to know people, who's doing what. So open environment is something that great people like. Mediocre people would love to be behind a closed door, right? Playing games and stuff. And <laughs> You know, yeah, and uh, yeah, so candor, candor is the other thing. I mean, talented people like to know where they stand because they know life's too short. They know they have other options. Even in tough economies, talented people always have options and you have to tell them where they stand. This is going well, this is a gap, we do it twice a year. And you know, this is the plans, what's your future here, what you think, what are the next steps. Talented people like that. Talented people are high maintenance people. It's much easier to work with mediocre people in that respect. They never come to you. They try to hide from you, right? They love the closed doors. Talented people ask you every day, What's, what about my future? Am I doing okay? I have an idea. I don't think this is going well. I think the company is missing this opportunity. I mean, it's high maintenance. But that's much better to have that than to have people that are, don't want to talk to you. And when you talk to them, they have no ideas. They think the status quo is the best thing that can happen, right? which is never the case, especially in the moments in the kind of world we live today. So again, just trying to, to summarize meritocracy, the thing about people that you need to dedicate time with people, just like a coach in a successful sports team would do it. Think about that. For 20 years of my life, that was the case. Why should I forget all that and start behaving in a weird, low-performing type way to build a low performance culture. Is that what we want after all these years of study in business school? Of course not. The other thing that's very important for guys like you that are going to be leaders in the organization is to know what kind of pressure to put in the system. Look at the Olympics, World Cup, I mean the Giants when they were playing their games, the World Series, I mean congratulations by the way, and uh, it took 50 years but fine, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, you look at, at pro professional athletes playing. They're not having fun when they're about to, to play. Think about the 100 meter, 100 meter dash. They film those guys, they're totally focused, they're not thinking about anything else other than to get from here to here in nine seconds or whatever, okay? So they're totally focused and there's a lot of pressure built from the fact that you have 60,000 people watching them, their contracts, you know, their family, their wives, whoever. In a company, if you want the best of people, as a leader, you have to put pressure all the time. If you put too much pressure, people panic. That's bad. That's bad. If you put too little pressure, people are having a great time. <laughs> you know, the targets are easy, and you don't expect too much. I mean, if we grow half of what we could, that's fine. I mean, that's okay. We'll pay bonus for that as well. And, you know, shareholders didn't get their value. Uh, th there was no value creation, but oh, we'll pay bonus anyway, and that kind of thing. I mean, no, you won't get the best of people, and again, the great people will leave. They don't like this kind of environment. So as a leader, you need to know that people, all of us, we are at our best when we are under pressure, healthy pressure. Think about school. When, when, when do you really get your mind around things? This is when you de have a, de a deadline, right? I mean, you have a deadline. You have that work that you need to, to deliver tomorrow. Man, you are as focused as a razor blade, and you don't think about anything. You cancel everything. Your social agenda goes to hell. Your Facebook is off. Everything is off, you know. <laughs> you, just, you just work on that thing, you know. That's when, the, when you get the best of you. When you get transferred within a company to a, we like to do that a lot, what we call the crazy promotions. We got a guy from sales, put the guy in supply chain, for example, because we, we, we believe that that's the way to, to build people. And again, the magic word, take people out of their comfort zone. Whenever we are in a place that's too comfortable, it's bad. That's bad. You have to take from time to time people from their comfort zone because that's when this whole idea of the athlete 
100 meter dashboard, that focus, that thing, oh my God, I have three months to learn this new job, that's when you really move to the next level. If you stay, if you stay 10 years in the same job, not saying the same company, we love people who stay 20 years, 30 years in our company, but 10 years doing the same thing, the same job, in the same region, I mean, at some point, you got stale. I mean, you got used to landscape. You don't see, you know, A from B, black from white, because everything has been there for such a long time. And you can only learn this much per day. And as you don't learn because you're used to it, you're not going to recover that going forward. So you're wasting your time. Okay? So that's very important, too, that whole pressure. Take people out of the comfort zone. That's the way to develop great people. The third leg of the stool is culture. So I, I spoke about dream, people, now culture. Culture in our company we call, it's a culture of ownership. We don't like the word professionals, executives. We like the word owners. Think about this. Owners are the guys that live and die by their business because that's all they have. If you have a bakery and that's where you get your livelihood from, that bakery has to succeed. Failure is not an option and you have to be competitive. You have to understand your customers. You cannot lose customers to Walmart just because they open across the street. You have to rethink your business, but that's your business. You're not going to hop on to the next job. That's your life. So owners, we like owners because of that. Because they're going to live with the consequences of their decision. I like to give an example that caused me already some trouble, but I keep going back to the same example of the rental car. Okay? It doesn't happen to me. But I've heard some people ride, drive a rental car in a different way than they drive their own car. I have, it doesn't happen to me. <laughs> Some people like to try things, weird things in rental cars. And, uh, you know, <laughs> experiments, experiments. <laughs> Again, I've heard that. I've heard even people that say, don't be gentle, it's a rental. <laughs> see, how, see how weird people can be? I tell you, it's, the world out there is a weird place. But I mean, a rental car. Why, why, why do these people behave like that with a rental car? I think it's because it's, they're not going to live with the consequences of their driving. So they're going to drive, experiment. There will be consequences to the car. They'll give back the car to the, one of those companies, and somebody else will live with the consequences next day. Your car. It's going to be your car today, tomorrow, next month, next year, next five years. You drive in a different way. We want our car to be your company, not, not like a rental company. And we have lots of stuff that we do within the company from all the way to share ownership, which is the classic way. But more important than that is the mindset. We believe that people to have shares, options, variable compensation, which we're very aggressive at, they first need to have the ownership mindset. And there are many things in the company that we do to foster that environment that this is my machine. If I work at a, at a brewing plant and I have a canning line uh, or a brew, a brew house, this is my part of the world. There are some uh, rules. This is the sandbox, but within the sandbox, I own it. We would fail if people would have to ask at some point, would have failed if at some point our key guys have to ask the questions, what about if I had my own business? This is your business. That's the environment we try to foster. It's a big startup. We always say that. We like that flexibility of a startup where people are always trying to do new things within, of course, some ba very basic agreed rules. So. We don't lose advantage of being a large company. So the rental car example is one that I like because I think it talks to the essence of ownership. And we all understand that. At least some people understand that. I think other things about our culture. A lot of people say they're very focused on the consumer. We say that too. Because the consumer is, is the boss. That's right. I mean, think about this. People don't need to buy beverages. If tomorrow they decide just to drink water out of, out of the tap, I mean, I would have no business. Okay. And most of our competitors would have no business. So it's that simple, right? So, but we try to take that to the next level. For example, we try to take that to the way we manage the company. I try to think, if the guy buying my Stellar Trois is paying a premium over my Budweiser, Bud Light, other products, what do they expect me to do with that money as a consumer? If I have lavish offices and corporate jets and you know, five-course meals when I travel, and four seasons and all that, we always say the asset test. Would our consumers be proud if they knew we spent their money like that? Or would they feel better if we have a lean company where we have more money to spend in things that are important for them? An NFL sponsorship, a Major League Ball sponsorship, the Olympics, the World Cup. 
so many things that they like, that they see as a return for what they're paying for the product. So we try to be lean, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because our consumers would be proud of us knowing that we're managing their money in a way to have more to give back as opposed to spend in between friends and the company. You know? So we're very lean because we believe, so we call this the cost connect win. The more non-working dollars that are dollars that consumers are not willing to pay a premium for because they don't see it, they don't touch it, don't drink it, don't take home, don't pay for it. So non-working dollars, the more we get non-working dollars to become working dollars, things that consumers value, the more we connect with them because they see we're giving back to them, the more we win more business and more consumers. Cost connect win. And that's why the, 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 the way to grow a company is, all, is always, and I'm going to say here, the finance 101, top line and cost efficiencies. Do both. But if you only do costs, it's a short thing. You can only do so much. And the way to get people excited about costs, because it's a tough thing to get people excited about, is to connect that with the top line. Saying so the more money we find here, the more we're going to revert back to the marketplace where it matters, and the more consumers and business will win. Okay? Leadership, that's an important thing in our culture. Our culture is only passed from person to person by means of leadership. Your actions, as we all know, are more important than words. What's important about leadership? I'll tell you in five minutes what we we'll discover. First, who is the leader in the company? We say anybody who needs a team to get to a target. If you can get to a target by yourself in that role, you're not being a leader. You don't need to be a leader. You're not in a leadership position because by yourself you can get to your target. If you need a team to get together to a target, you're in a leadership position. What's the def definition of leadership? Companies, that wrote, I mean, people write books about it. We have three, three dimensions. Leadership is all about delivering results on a consistent basis with your team, because by the very definition, you cannot do it alone, do it the right way. So you can build on top and you can replicate the way you did it to other parts of the business. That's leadership. Leadership's a very important trait in, a, in guys like you that are going to join companies. Very hard to define, but you know when you see a good one. These three things are just basic definitions, but I like, to see, I like to say other things about leadership. Leadership is a guy that can see the world out there, which is a very complex world, and translate that via analysis into simple things. Think about this. I have, out of the 100 plus thousand people in our company, we have 70,000 that are sales reps. They're very smart. They're street smart. But I don't have time to explain to them everything that happens in the marketplace in terms of deep dives, studies, analysis that we do, elasticities, everything we do in the marketplace. Not because they can't get it, because they don't have time. They're busy. They're the ones bringing the money in, facing the customers. They need to have customer facing time. So as a leader, we need to understand the world out there, which is very complex, but translate that into two, three, five action things that can be done by 80,000 people. Think about the automobile. Think about the automobile. How many of us drive here? Everybody. Think about if we had to understand about thermodynamics, mechanical engineer, you know, metal, I mean, everything that goes into a car under the hood. Somebody was smart enough to put two pedals and a steering wheel and a shift, and everybody drives, even without knowing what's under the hood. That's genius. I mean, you took a very complex type machine and you made it so simple to operate that billions of people around the world can operate. That's the thing about leadership in a company. 90% of the people in the company, if you were to compare with a ship, need to be running the, the, the engine room. But you need some people in the, in the bridge, looking at, at the bridge, looking at where the ship's going. But the 90% doesn't need to know that. They need to because they have a busy life, very busy life. So leadership's about that. Leadership's about not being selfish. If you have questions about your company, try to get them clear because you're referenced to your team, okay? So those are some things uh, about leadership. The other thing, last one in culture is no shortcuts. We work a lot with Jim Collins that used to be a professor here at business school. I met him in 88, 87 when I was here and uh, he works a lot with us. And, uh, and uh, once I taped an interview with him for a global conference of ours and I asked Jim, I read, I read your book, Good to Great, for me, it's so common sense, and it's even better because it's based on research, so it's not your opinion, it's based on research. Why would companies choose not to do what's in your book if that's a recipe book to go from good to great? 
And he says, Brito, you know what the problem is in my research and contacts with companies? All companies start with the same good, you know, ideas and the good intent. But at some point, they start looking for shortcuts. So instead of forming their own people, building their own bench strength, they go in the market and hire. Somebody else did their job for them, right? Instead of hiring somebody out of school, 22 years old, and form this guy to be a great marketeer, why not go to a, a great marketing company out there, a P&G, a Coke, a Pepsi, an Isaac Bush and hire somebody from this company, right? But then you hire people from all the companies and you don't have the culture, the fabric that holds everybody together. And that takes 20 years to build. It's in one month, it's gone. So that's why, in his view, and I agree, a lot of good companies never get to be great because they are looking for shortcuts. They don't, want to, they don't understand that to build a great company, it takes time, it's brick by brick, person by person. Yes, it takes a long time, but once you build it and you keep the gap to your competitors, it's hard for them to catch up. Because a lot of the things I'm talking about here, dream people culture, is very invisible. It's not about a better product. It's not about this will come as well, but it's about what's behind. That's invisible. That's hard to touch. It takes 10 years to build. To finish up, let me, see, let me tell you this. For me, that's the best kept secret in our company. I'm not saying it's the only way to do it. I'm just saying it's the best kept secret. You know what? Because every time I talk about this, uh, not to you, but for, you know, from people from other companies, other CEOs and stuff, the reaction I get is that, of course, but this is so common sense. I mean, yeah, having a dream, so a big idea, uh, hiring the very best people, and then having this culture of ownership, it's your company, no shortcuts and stuff. And for me, it's great that they think like that, especially my competitors, because they take it for granted. They take it for granted, and they don't do what we try to do, which is not to take it for granted, talk about it every single time we have an opportunity to do a town hall, to do a q and on it with our employees. I always do a 10-minute Dream People Culture introduction, and then to give time you know, to warm up, and then it is. Because this is what we're all about. This is what brought us here from a very small company to the top five consumer goods company. We're very humble to say that because we have to earn it every day. There's no such a thing as, oh, we got there. No, no, no. The, the more you go up, the more you have to, to, to fall. We know that, so in a very humble way. But at least I can show you this is not a, a concept with no proof. The other thing I can tell you is that we grew our company organically and also through M&A, and Isaac Bush being the last one we did. But in the last 12 years, we did five cross countries big combinations, as we call it. And in every time we combine with a company in our own sector, we ask the questions because we could see at the guts of our competitors in different countries and say, okay, why are we performing as a company? On average, we're not perfect, far from it, but on average, performing better than this other company. And the only answer I could always get to was dream people culture, in the sense that we had a group of people that aimed higher, had a sense of purpose, better, higher, more elevated than this other company. I had people that were better, more talented, and I have a culture of ownership. This is my company, not my job. And that made a, a huge difference. So with that, I'd like to open for questions. Thank you very much. Yes, there's a question here, too. So, uh, you talked a lot about how you create this meritocratic culture. Can you talk a little bit more about how you drive that culture down into the organization? Be, you know, at four levels deep, how do you make sure that those managers are creating that type of culture for the people that Very are working them? Very good point. Very good point. We do that, for example, the best, the best example would be, for example, the, the, the merger we did with Anheuser-Busch, the Budweiser company, just two years ago in the midst of this whole financial crisis and stuff. Uh, what we do, and this was the fifth one we did it, we learned that when you do such a thing, you have to start talking. When I went there to St. Louis, the day after we signed the merger agreement, I went there, I, I, I gathered the, the top leadership of the company. All I spoke about was dream people culture. Because once you set that framework, every question, you go back to that framework. So when they said, oh, what's your opinion about this? I said, well, as you said, and we have a thing called our 10, ten principles. So dream people culture for us, if you go to our website, you see it's a 10 principle thing, you know. One for dream, two for people, seven for culture. And it's great, it's a great frame for you to anchor things. And what you have to do in our experience to change, when I talk about culture, 
it's, it's important to say that we believe a lot in national cultures. We don't want to change those. That's why we travel. That's why life's so interesting when you travel, because people dress differently, spend their free time in a different way, have different family ties, eat differently. That's why we travel, different architecture. But the company, no. We say it's one company, one culture. We have zero complacency for differences in basic stuff, like a, uh, a constitution of a country. So this company that's going to join us, this is how we operate. And I never met anybody who said, I don't agree with this. If you want to be a high performer, just like an athlete, that's what you have to do. Have a dream, surround yourself with great people, work hard. That's what you have to do. But I, I'm not up for it. I've met some people that said that. I'm in a stage of my life and this and that. I'm not up for it. And, but I think if you want to do what you want to do, that's, I agree with this. So what we do is we try to get the leadership of the company. Because in a company, it's all like this. You have 20% who are the leaders, 70% who will follow mostly what the leaders, because they use the leaders as, as, as their you know, place for Q&A and inspiration and all that, if the, the leaders are good leaders. And you have at the bottom 10 or 15%, whatever the balance, that are always against anything. You know? So those so guys, you have to identify and bang, out. Uh, I think what, what was good in this last uh, transaction that we did is that the first layer of management left day one for different reasons. Some because they were retiring, some because they were too rich to care because of the price we paid, and some because we, we felt it wouldn't have a good fit. It was great because then we promoted a lot of new people that have been waiting for that opportunity. And these new people said, this is my company now. And I like this stuff, you know, because it's all about high performance, meritocracy, openness, you know, candor. That's my company I've been waiting for. So now let's do this according to this. So it's all about making sure you have the right leaders, because the right leaders will get that other 60 or 70 percent of the people along with them, and they'll also identify the, the, the bad apples and, and take them out. And there is a bottom 10, 15 percent that for sure uh, will have to go out. Yeah. But it's about the leadership. Uh, yeah, question here. Okay, let's go. Quick questions. Go. Then the speaking up opportunities and the free speech in an organization and cultures and countries that always have a, have always ingrained in a deference to authority. For example, You're right. Very good question. China, for example. Uh, or in, uh, yeah, or in, Russia. in any authoritarian country. Yeah, that's a very good example. Uh, you're right. When we, when we started expanding as a company, we had that, that thing in mind. Uh, and, I, and the one I, I was talking to you about national cultures, we said, okay, are we going to be able to find people in all those other different cultures that we're going to go, you know, the four national cultures that were brought up in a different way that will, you know, get excited about the way we're trying to build our company or not? And the fact of the matter, yes, you can find. You find a lot of people in those places that uh, have been looking for this kind of thing because they came from sports, they came from a competitive school, and they know that that's what built uh, a great performance. And they're just waiting for an opportunity to go to a corporation where those things are accepted allowed. But you're right. You have to look harder in places like some of the ones we mentioned. But over there, you'll find great people that, have, that are looking for that kind of place where they can be themselves. Okay? So it is possible. Thank you. Um, yeah, go. So uh, my question is on delegation. And how do you, you maybe using your sports analogy, you know, great coaches know when to direct their team and when to just trust that their team will figure it out. And, and how do you kind of translate that into the business and, as being a leader and when to delegate and when to make the decision yourself? I think that's, that's a very good question. I think the, 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 the people that we value in our business, it's a very different mix. As you go up to your organization, you have to keep that apparently that false dilemma that you have to think more, you know, where the company is going strategically, but you cannot lose touch with the business. That's why we try to have fewer layers in the company, open office space, okay? We value leaders that can ask questions that are very detailed, but not losing sight of the big picture. That's what we value. Because people, when they're having meetings with me, they know, I'm not saying I'm the best, but I mean, they know, because I've been in the company for a long time, uh, that I can ask questions, special sales, because that's my background, uh, detailed questions. I always say that when I go to a meeting, a board meeting, 80% of the board meeting is my preparation. The benefit that I have to go to a board meeting, 80% is myself getting prepared for that conversation. I have a tough board. 
20% I learned on the board. I think the meetings I have with my people is, is the same thing. 80% is them preparing with their people to try to understand the drivers, the root causes of issues, and come prepared. 20% will come in our discussion, but 80% is the preparation. But this, this capacity to not lose sight of the big picture, but feel comfortable in selecting one or few areas, and there you go deep, that's appreciated by the organization because they see, oh, I can count on him to help us here. And that also gets your meetings to be much more productive because people prepare. Because they know at some point you can ask here or there. They never know. Okay? You cannot micromanage the company. That's bad. Because if you micromanage the company, you create a whole bunch of people, like sometimes, sometimes in the Army, that I use to follow orders. We want people to think. But they should know that despite your thinking more strategically, most of the times, that you can go deep. That's why we go a lot to the market, we visit the market, we hear from customers, we like to be with our frontline people, because that's where you learn what's going on. Yeah, two questions real quick. How do you continue to push yourself out of your comfort zone? And two, uh, what's your favorite beer? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite beer is Budweiser. The, the king of beers. <laughs> for 20 years, for 20 years, we had this dream of doing something with them, with Anheuser Bush. Never worked, and it finally worked after 20 years. So that that's something that we always had in our minds, as uh, as the beer that can be a global beer, an iconic brand, an American iconic brand. So much so as Starbucks, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, so many other iconic brands that sell so much, so well around the world. America continues to be an aspirational place. I'm not American, I'm Brazilian, but I recognize that through research. America continues to be a magnet for young people around the world, talented people, young people, people that want to make things happen and have an opportunity. They all want to come here. Americans take it for granted, but people from outside value and know that the opportunities are here. Uh, to your first question, what was it again? Continue, how do you continue to push yourself out of your comfort zone? Two things, from, from underneath and from above. I mean, first, I'm very critical of myself, has always been. So people say, when I'm critical to other people and tough on other people, uh, they say, Brito, we accept that because you know you do even worse with yourself. So I'm the kind of guy that for me to celebrate anything is very hard. That's a criticism I often get because I'm always looking at the next step. And I always think, yeah, it was good, but this, you know, but. And everybody says that what's important in a sentence is what comes after the but, <laughs> right? You should never listen before the but. When somebody says, oh, yeah, it was all great and stuff, and, uh, but, then you listen, because that's what matters. <laughs> so I push myself out, out of my comfort zone because of the board I have. As I said in the other questions, a very tough board that forces me to up my game all the time because I hire people that are better than I am and because I don't want them to, to get my job anytime soon. I have to keep running, you know, and getting myself, reinventing myself in some respects. And I'm very critical of myself as well. So I think that's the, the beauty of having great people surrounding you. They give you the energy and the motivation to continue to reinvent, learn, push yourself to the next level. Again, if you have a whole bunch of mediocre people, you're going to feel good about yourself, you know, when you shouldn't. And then you're going to, the world will continue to do this and you're going to be here. Okay? Questions? Last question. Okay. Uh, I, uh, you sound very ambitious, and I like that. I have, I have two questions. <laughs> I have two questions. The first question is, what's your uh, next merger target? The, <laughs> the, the second question is, uh, do you have any ambitious plans to, to upgrade the taste of uh, Budweiser? I, mean, I haven't had Budweiser for the, for the past 10 years. <laughs> Thanks for the question. You know, you know one thing, and that I, uh, we can show because it's uh, third-party research. Budweiser, in blind tests, blind tests, and that makes a huge difference, I reckon. In blind tests, is the best liquid in the domestic market, set by consumers. So our challenge is, why is that that when we label the product, people have different perceptions about the liquid, okay? And it, it, we know that we have a challenge there. As with most iconic brands, sometimes you fall in that trap that the brand is so iconic that you cannot change it. Consumers move, the brands stay. And now consumers are here, the brands here. And because of that, 
We defined this as a problem two years ago when we merged, because before it was not seen as a problem because Bud Light was you know, skyrocketing and compensating for the, the Budweiser slippage. But we said, no, 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 these two brands are now two huge brands, number one and two in the US and in the world. So we need to give Budweiser what it deserves. We did a lot of research. There's a lot of positives, some negatives, and some other things that we need to bring to the bud, to, to, to the brand because of its iconic status. So I'm very excited. And if you look at Budweiser outside of the US, it's growing like crazy, especially in China. Um, your other question is about ambition. I think whenever people ask me about the, in the company, you know, what's our next step, I always say deleveraging. Deleveraging. Because, I mean, we took a lot of money to be able to, to do this transaction with AB. So we're ahead of our deleverage uh, uh, plan, and uh, we're very happy with it. Our cash flow generation, you're right, is huge. It's north of free cash of um, seven, eight billion a year. And uh, that's a real problem, I mean, what to do with it. <laughs> but it's a good problem to have, and uh, we'll think about it when we have to cross a bridge. But for now, we're using that cash flow to pay down debt and pay interest to regain our freedom. Okay? So again, guys, uh, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for your time. Thank you.